Well, hello. Welcome. My name is Brent Morgan. I'm a director at Rogers Reedy uh, in Australia. Um, Rogers Reedy is a member of the um, BTG Global Advisory Group. And we're here, the last one for the year, um, the last webinar for the year, and, and we're very blessed. Um, and I'm very blessed to have three fantastic speakers here today. The, the panel uh, from all parts of the world and all parts of the uh, BTG Global Advisory Group. I'll, I'll introduce them in, in a few minutes. Um, they're eagerly waiting to um, have a chat about um, our webinar today, which is the global economy uh, and their insights into the global economy uh, in their part of the world. We'll start, start first and say we're not going to talk about the World Cup. We've got someone from the US, we've got someone from the UK, we're just Glad that it was a it was a draw. We didn't want any animosity at the start of it. Um, God forbid uh, that Australia play England uh, or the US if we are lucky enough to progress. Um, uh, you know, it it, uh, it is an exciting time for uh, for sport around the world and a lovely distraction. As I said, um, I'm, my name is Brent Morgan, director at Rogers Reedy, um, and we are uh, an active uh, and excited member of the B2G Global Advisory. Who are Rogers Reedy? Uh, we're an insolvency firm, an international insolvency firm in all states of Australia. Um, and we're also in New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. For our international um, clients, um, I will try to dumb down my, my thick Australian accent so it's at least um, understandable, um, but uh, I'll slow it down as best I can. Excellent. Um, Let's talk about the world economy, which is why we're here today. We're here to talk about uh, the, the world economy. We, we run these webinars on a regular basis, uh, but today we're going to explore the world's economy. Um, we're looking outside of Australia to see what the impacts are on the rest of the world. And um, we know that the economic forecasters uh, are suggesting some tough times ahead. The IMF, for instance, have said, that, said that the worst is yet to come when looking at the global marketplace, which is quite ominous. Bloomberg is talking about a 20% drop in global property values as a massive correction to overpricing. And Australia, as an example, is the fourth most nation at risk, which we've been saying for some time. We're seeing massive insolvencies in China, for instance, which uh, we'll talk about later. Construction companies running into the billions are failing in China. And the flow on in China is seeing um, the, the raw materials, um, soaring inflation, rising interest rates, impact constructions from an individual housing to blocks towers um, in, in China. Groups like the World Economic Forum are telling us that the cost of living has triggered pessimistic forecasts going forward. Um, and it also says the US economy shrank for the second consecutive quarter. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I've got someone who knows it much better to talk about that later, um, often considered a, a technical definition for a recession. Here, um, are advising us soon if he thinks that the US are in a recession. Uh, consumer world confidence is, is at a low if, if, uh, if what we're hearing is true, um, and there's some key indicators around the world of downturns. The World Bank is echoing that many countries are, are likely to experience recession um, in the next 12 months. The war in Ukraine, which we spoke about in detail in one of our early webinars um, this year, um, is, is having some um, major impacts around the world and is uh, and economically is impacting. We will talk about that. But what does it mean for China, Europe and the US? Do they bounce back after the COVID pandemic? Um, we'll talk about that. Our three speakers, I've said we're blessed. We are. We, we've got uh, three amazing speakers from the round, around the world. Uh, the first who we'll hear today um, is, is, is someone who is very comfortable in front of the camera, um, and his name is Art Hogan. He's the Managing Director and Chief Marketing Strategist at B. Riley Wealth, and it's based in New York, which we, which we love. His commentary in straightforward manner has made Art a respected and well-known figure in financial media for many, many years, uh, and his knowledge on the world economy is, uh, is, is paramount. He frequently appears on live uh, interviews on CNBC, 
Fox Business and Bloomberg TV. And he's quoted regularly in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. We, we've got something in common, Art. Um, I don't say that I'm ever quoted in anything like that. Yahoo Finance um, and the Financial Times are just some of the other um, media outlets that Art is, uh, is quoted. Good morning, good evening, Art from New York. Thank you for, uh, for, for attending today. We're, we're very, um, very happy to have you on board. Welcome. What are you seeing in, in North America at the moment and, and what, what are you telling um, you know, your clientele um, about the next 12 months, uh, two years in, in the US? Terrific. Thanks so much for having me. It's such a thrill uh, to be with you all today. And, and I think you laid this out pretty nicely. You know, there's a lot of things we're concerned about. You know, coming out of a pandemic, um, at the end of last year, um, came with its own problems. And I think those problems were pretty obvious. Um, supply chains were disrupted. Um, consumption patterns were turned upside down. We were consuming more goods than services. And, and that's just not normal. But if you went back for the last 50 years, typically in North America, you'd consume about 30 to 35 percent goods and 60 to 65 percent services any given year. And, and typically, you know, that flow has been almost exactly the same for, since World War II. It turned that on its head when we're sort of in lockdown. You obviously create you know, your own sort of problems with supply chains becoming jammed up and and, um, and and people just not being able to avail themselves of services. Well, flash forward to the beginning of this year, and a lot of that rectified itself, right? We, the supply chains are much better. The cost to transport something from China to, to Los Angeles is down about 80 percent. But that's happening um, in a positive way for goods pricing, but the service side of the economy still is trying to get labor, still trying to get people uh, to work. So, you know, it's still hard to get an airplane ticket in a hotel room. So the inflation pressure from goods is now shifted to services. And, and unfortunately, that seems to be a little more stubborn. So all, all the while that that is going on, we have China with its ongoing zero COVID policies that are disrupting some of those supplies chains that had just reopened and it completely removed China in large part from the global economy. So, you know, we, we saw more about that just over this weekend with protests going on in real time. And, and clearly that's one of the major headwinds we're facing right now. The other clearly, as you mentioned, Russia's war in Ukraine, which we all assumed would last about uh, four weeks is going into its first full year. It was just Thanksgiving of last year that uh, we saw there were 300,000 Russian soldiers uh, working their way to the border of Ukraine. And so we've gone through an entire year of a war in, in Ukraine that clearly is adversely affecting all sorts of uh, parts of the global economy. I will tell you this, inflation is probably the dominant issue in the US economy right now. The good news about that is it's getting better, right? So we've had two sequential months of CPI and PPI inflation that is work lower. And if you look at forecasts and our forecast, see that inflation, while not getting to our central bank's 2% target, is likely to exit this year with a four handle versus an eight handle uh, on core CPI. That's good news. I think that the, the other piece of the good news is if, if our forecast is right, we'll likely see it close enough to the Fed's target for them to actually start cutting rates in the fourth quarter of next year. The market hasn't priced that in yet. What the market is pricing in is the eventual recession that's going to be caused by their aggressive monetary policy and a slowing global economy. So for us, when we look at that and say, okay, what typically happens in a recession, a normal recession, not a recession like the great financial crisis or coming out of the dot-com bubble or the beginning of a pandemic, but just your, your average recession, we've had 10 of them since World War II. And in an average recession, we typically see equity valuations go down between 30 and 35%. And the good news on that is it usually happens before they even declare the recession. And while we're likely on our way out of the recession, markets have gotten better. They tend to price things in in six months in advance. And we've seen the S&P 500 already down the better part of 30 percent this year. The Nasdaq's been down the better part of 40 percent this year. So we've priced in a lot of that bad news. The unfortunate problem with equity markets right now is there's a lot of market participants that have never seen interest rates that are above zero. And we spent about a decade of very low interest rates that caused a lot of investments that were probably not suitable in a normalized uh, interest rate environment. And as Warren Buffett always likes to say, when the tide goes out, you'll find out who's been swimming naked. And we found out a lot of those trades or those investments 
that make sense in a very low interest rate environment are just not making sense right now. So we've seen a lot of multiple contraction in the much more um, risky ends of the of the investment spectrum. And I think that's healthy. I think it's normalizing. And that's both in public markets and private markets. And, and I think that's going to be an ongoing process. But luckily, we've gotten a, a lot of that in the public markets done already. The, the most extreme um, sectors that you know were were good ideas because they were growing revenues very rapidly, but we're going to be pre-earnings for the next two or three years, have lost 60, 70, 80 percent of their value. I think that's a healthy part of that normalization process. I think the other healthy piece of, of what we're learning about monetary policy is it's got long and variable lags. And this has been a Federal Reserve, a central bank that has not waited for any of those lags, but likely starts to wait for them uh, in the month of December. I think the, the, the Fed is going to slow the pace of their tightening. And I think they're going to probably end up at or about a 5% Fed funds rate. That'll be the terminal rate. And that likely happens in the first quarter. And historically, when that happens, markets can breathe a sigh of relief. You know what your interest rates are going to look like for the, the, the short-term horizon or the foreseeable future. And I think that's a real positive. So we're at a place now where we had to adjust to a rising interest rate environment, one that we hadn't seen for a decade. We're, we're slowly navigating through the process of getting services available, and the supply chains are, are acting much better. The consumer remains pretty confident, and the consumer um, actually showed some great activity through what we refer to as Black Friday. It's the beginning of our holiday shopping season and Cyber Monday. All the reports look like we still have robust consumer spend. The most important thing to me is that the, that 40 percent of the inflation that we're seeing has already started to roll over, but the government won't measure it for a few months. And that's that's the household sector, the, the, the housing industry. So if, if you or I were to say, what do you think your house is worth? We would probably go to a place like a Zillow or a a red fin and, and, and try to price that. What the government does is calculate something called homeowners equivalent rent, and that has a lag of about four months. So if we actually use Zillow data for our consumer price index, we'd probably all already be in the fours, and I think that's a big positive. So we, we know that there's a lot of tightening in the channel. We know that a lot of the house price uh, degradation has not been priced into our CPI indexes, and, and we're going to start to see that as the months move ahead. So I think there's as much good news as there is bad news, but I think the most important thing for us, at some juncture, China has to come off of this zero COVID policy and get back in the global economy. Their demand for goods and services is sorely missed. We're seeing that on all sorts of commodities and certainly on all sorts of services. I think the other piece of the puzzle is I think Russia is going to find an exit ramp in this war that we thought would last approximately a month and is now going into its second year. And both of those would be significant tailwinds for the economy as well. So that's where we stand now. And, and as we uh, um, as we uh, work our way into the into the new year, I think a lot of these uh, headwinds become tailwinds. And, and uh, what, what about the um, I mean, the Republicans now control the House um, and the Democrats, just with the help of a, a couple of independents, control the Senate. Um, and we've got Biden in, in, um, in the White House. That dynamic, how is that going to impact monetary policy in the U.S. and, 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 and achieving um, you know, changes? Yeah, that's such a great question. We just went through a midterm election. Um, three things to think about in terms of the election and its results. Midterm elections typically are, are a pretty good time for markets. Markets have a history of being up 80% of the time, going back to World War II again in a midterm election year, especially after the results come in, agnostic of who wins. But even better news is that we're going to have divided government. So we have two chambers of our com uh, Congress and the House of Representatives will now be held by the Republicans, formerly held by the Democrats. And the good news on that is, you really get gridlock and the market uh, tends to like gridlock because you don't get any major changes in policy and regulation. There's no new taxes proposed. So very little gets done and the market's very uh, happy about the fact that you're not going to have any new potential fiscal policy initiatives move forward. So while it, while it seems counterintuitive that the market would like gridlock, the market certainly likes gridlock in government. And, and post this this midterm election, we're going to certainly have that. And the markets expressed that view um, since the middle of October, with the polling looking like that's what the eventual uh, outcome would be. The market's up, you know, some ten percent on the S and P five hundred, and and uh, 
and a similar amount on, on the Dow Jones and about half of that on the Nasdaq. So the market's starting to look at this as not just the, the calendar effect, but certainly the actual election effect. And I think that's a real positive. And, and, and uh, without being political, um, Donald Trump, um, him putting his hand up that he will run um, for the president again. Has there been any commentary um, in respect of that having a positive or a negative impact on the markets? Well, it's interesting that you would say that necessarily. And when we think about this, first of all, we don't have an election for two years. Um, so you know, there's a lot of daylight in between you know, raising your hand now and actually um, getting, getting into a primary and winning that and, and being your party's choice for the presidential election. So I think there's, there's, for the market, I think it's a non-event unless and until we find out who else is raising their hand um, and what the what the, the former president's you know chance is of actually winning. So right now, not knowing what the field even looks like, I think the market is saying, you know, let's take a wait and see on this. Now, if it were to come down that uh, Donald Trump was still enthusiastic about doing this, polling shows him as winning the nomination. But again, two years out, uh, polling uh, data is probably not sufficient to make an investment decision on. Excellent. Art, uh, thank you very much for your uh, timely and informative um, uh, insight into uh, into the US uh, economy. Really appreciate that. Um, moving to uh, another part of the world, um, different time of, of the day. Uh, we're blessed uh, to have Adrian Hyde, who is a partner of Begbie's Trainer Group, um, a licensed insolvency practitioner and a non-practicing solicitor. Um, um, want to hear more about that. He's the firm's international practice head uh, and is based in London. Agents Insolvency Practice uh, focuses on offshore and cross-border work, including litigation, asset tracing um, and regulatory driven appointments. He practices a wide range of uh, matters varying in size um, and jurisdiction. Adrian, um, thank you for uh, for attending today. Um, England is still in the World Cup, so we've got you here today, which is good. Um, how, how's the? <laughs> do, do we talk about the the general excitement in the UK? Because you, you you're bringing it home, aren't you? You're bringing the, the trophy home as as. Uh, they all say in England every time the World Cup comes around. I, I think my views on the positivity of the World Cup are about as good as my views on the positivity of the economy uh, in the UK. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> I think the football is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, it's been really interesting looking at looking at uh, the UK and Europe and the similarities and the contrast between the different uh, economies and. You know, they say there, there are lies, damn lies and statistics. And I think the, the same can be said for forecasts. Um, opinions vary as to where the UK is and where it will be over the next couple of years. Um, but there are trends that you can pick up from the various data sources and, it, and, and they just have various degrees of extremity. So the, the, the broad consensus is that 2022 will be positive for GDP growth. 2023 will be neutral or negative. And the majority of people think that 23 will be recessionary. And then they're forecasting that by the time we're into early 24, we'll be back into growth, although it will be fairly small. Um, what's been interesting is if you look at the history of the change, if you look at the history of those predictions, they've changed during this year quite significantly. So if you started at the beginning of the year, the predictions for 2022 growth were much lower and they've been revised upwards as the year has gone on. Growth for next year has been revised downwards and has got, got smaller and smaller from a growth trend and then, and then actually into recession. But the, the big one, I think, which, um, which does echo something that Art said, was that predictions for increases in interest rates have been revised downwards. So the, the markets are priced in during this year, um, interest rate rises that the market thinks now are not actually going to occur. So if you look at fixed rate mortgages, um, we, we run 
very differently the model in housing market in the UK from the US. So we would tend to get a two-year fixed rate or a two-year tracker or a five-year fixed or a five-year tracker. At the moment, if you if you were taking an interest-only fixed, um, if you took a tracker mortgage, which would be a, a small percentage over the base rate, you'd be paying half what a five-year fix would be because they've priced in from the beginning of the from earlier in the year where they thought it was going to end up. And looking at some specific numbers, um, the various figures for growth this year um, are between three and four percent. Um, but one notable point is that the flex that goes with um, energy prices and all comes from the war in Ukraine. And an example of a figure, um, the PwC predictions are saying in the latter part of this year, if we have a hard winter versus a mild winter, that could make half a percent difference. They think between 3.1 and 3.6, depending on how the winter goes. Um, I mentioned earlier the evolution of the forecast as the year's gone on. Looking at the, uh, the EY Item Club, they were predicting growth in 23 of 1% in the summer. Three months later, the 22 forecast's gone up, and the positive forecast in 23 has been revised to a contraction of 0.3%. Um, and then they're still predicting 2.5% going into 24. A month after that, um, that downward trend from, from the EY Item Club, the, the UK budget for office responsibility, that's the sort of the government eye on looking at how government policy is turning out in the market. They're predicting um, a, a recession, a contraction of one and a half percent next year, um, and then growth of 1.8 year after. So it's, they're, you know, they're, they're all over the place. Um, the big thing for us is the volatility, and um, we've currently got inflation running at 11%, and the, the general consensus from all sides, the OECD, um, the government watchdogs and things, are saying that the vast majority of that is attributable to the disastrous budget from the very brief Liz Trust government, and that that's created so much uncertainty and killed confidence so badly um, that, that we're going to take some time to get over that. They're looking, so we currently got, we currently have uh, interest rate, base rate of 3%. Um, and just by comparison for the rest of Europe, the Eurozone is set by the European Central Bank and they've got 2% all the way across. So it's 1%, but it's also 50%, depending how you're looking at it. Um, so overall, it seems to be agreement that on the on the negative side, there is a global slowdown that's going to impact us, and that comes from a number of causes. UK inflation um, has caused a significant part, an insignificant part, by high energy costs. Um, on the positive side, our exports have done well, better um, because of the weak dollar, uh, the, the weakness of the pound against the dollar. Um, and forecasts for interest rates are better now than they were. Um, but there is agreement that we are facing a very difficult time, and they, the OECD has welcomed the positivity of the, uh, the huge spending cuts and tax increases, which are you know, 30 billion and 25 billion apiece, um, which they hope will help us go down from what's currently a 41 year high inflation rate. Just as a quick whiz round Europe, because um, I know we wanted to cover a few. I mean, looking at Italy, um, again, strong GDP this year, 3.7% is currently predicted, so almost identical to the UK. Um, forecast for, for next year, they are not forecasting at the moment, and the OECD aren't forecasting that they will go into recession. It will be marginal. And then in 24, some slight growth up to 1%. Um, Again, the indicators for them are high, high energy prices, falling real, inflate, falling real incomes because of, uh, of inflation. Um, their, their inflation is expected to top out at around 10% at the end of this year and then start going down. Um, I'll come on to one last thing at the end, uh, but savings rates 
is a fascinating subject in, within Europe. Um, Italy has a very low savings rate in its population, and that didn't change during COVID. It's quite significant. Um, looking at Germany, just highlights for Germany, they've got a tougher year this year, um, growth at less than 2% forecast and a swing into 0.3% recession next year. Again, adversely affected by energy prices and inflation hitting real value of, of earnings and savings. Um, they're suggesting that the OECD is suggesting that they will not suffer as badly as they might have done next year because they've got full order books because of because they were hit very badly by supply chain issues. And those supply chain issues are now um, easing very rapidly. Um, the only caveat to to the, the figures they've given are that they are incredibly sensitive, again, to energy supply costs. And they're very closely linked to Russia. They've been struggling to source alternative energy supplies. And a cold winter um, is likely to cause severe disruption to many of their production processes if they have to bring in gas rationing. Last but not least, France. Um, similar story, 2.6% this year. Still forecasting growth of just over half a percent next year and then up to 1.2 in 24. Um, their economy has been hit quite heavily by supply chain, a lot of industry there. Um, they've got higher unemployment and they their, their economy seems to have experienced more unemployment but less severe inflation. Um, their inflation is expected to hit nearly 6% this year, five and a half next year and two and a half the year after 24 um but they're very they're, they're very sensitive to uh, wage price inflation because of the heavily heavily unionized uh, workforce um which again it's, it's one of these things that comes out there's a, there's a real contrast between the issues in france with the workforce and the workforce the issues in germany with the workforce which is They've got nowhere near enough skilled people. They've got a very aging working population and they're doing everything they can to try and bring that, bring that back. Um, just two last things. Um, UK comparison to Europe. It's interesting to hear the similarities in the figures of growth this year, recession or marginal growth next year, etc. The big issue with the UK um, is the starting point in 20. 2022. The real story is the effect that the pandemic had on the UK economy. Between the fourth quarter 2019 and the third quarter this year, GDP in the UK had contracted across that period 0.4%. Over the 38 countries of the OECD, growth was 3.7%. And looking at G7 countries, the average was two and a half and we were the only ones in recession. So we suffered massively in that period. I will say the other thing, sorry, cut out my hesitation. <laughs> the, the, the last point that I made that, that um, I would say is, it's a very, it's a very interesting, and it's perhaps not long enough here to, to look at it all. But the differences in savings rates across Europe um, and how they changed during the pandemic um, were very significant. Um, I think uh, just sorry to distract you. It's, yeah, just with the forecast that you're seeing, are, are there are there any um, challenges or opportunities that you're seeing um, from the forecast? Yeah. Um, the the opposite sides of the, the, the same coin, really, and it, it, a lot of it's down to hu human capital. Um, and again, it's a big impact with the UK because the, the, the biggest issue that we've got on that side is Brexit. Um, we've got, I live in Kent, and we've got a very significant number of fruit farms and um, seasonal pickers here, and the farms can't get the, the farms can't get the staff. 
So they're torn between paying increasing amounts to UK staff and prices inflating so much that the stuff doesn't sell or leaving it to rot on the tree. You know, that's a real, that's a really difficult one. Said so before, Germany with its aging population, they've got a massive educational project going on to reskill people to try and get over there, um, to get over their difficulties. Um, and France, they've got high unemployment, so hopefully that will be the driver to not uh, to, to, to steer the workforces away from huge pay demand. Um, because if they do that, then unemployment is going to increase. It's the only way that inflation is not going to go through the roof. And what about, what about are there, apart from the ones that you've mentioned already, Adrian, are there particular sectors, industries that are probably showing more signs of stress than others? Um, I mean, you mentioned agriculture and getting staffing. Is, it, is there any other sectors? There's, there's a few. There's some... Um, Two key ones in the UK, retail and hospitality. Um, hospitality is very much driven by energy crisis. Um, you've got big pub chains, Weatherspoons, one of the best known pub chains in the UK is is closing a huge number of its outlets around the UK because they're, they're seeing footfall diminish um, and they're concerned about their overhead. Um, the other one is uh, is retail. In the last three weeks, there have been two major retailers have crashed. Um, a company called Jules, 200 million turnover, 1,000 staff, 130 stores um, gone. Made.com, um, an internet-based internet business, which was two years ago floated with three-quarters of a billion valuation. Um, and yeah. that's, that, that's gone into administration as well. I think those are the, those are the biggest two. And, and more, Adrian, do you think there's more retailers that you'll see uh, the same sort of fate? Um, do you think there's going to be more um, retail insolvencies? I mean, I mean, UK have had some big ones over the last, you know, five, five to ten years. I, th I think they, I think they will. I think we will see them. Um, there's been rationalisation in the sort of the the white goods retail and the electronics retail sector. There's been. Um, mergers and takeovers and buyouts um but there's still there's still a lot being sold over the internet that's that people are just not people are just not going to the stores to to see the stuff and buy it so i think i think retail is going to see more definitely so the high street stores that you know that, that the uk are, are known for i mean during lockdown and uh you know things moving to to the web um that is impacting, you know, this sort of stress it on the retailers. I mean, is the spend still sitting on the web, or is it is it slowly moving back to the high street stores? It, it's well, it's it is moving back a little to the high street stores, but um, it's not bouncing back in the same way. Um, you know, the 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 point that I, I touched on earlier is. Uh, the, the savings rates that uh, in the UK um, we went from saving across, I think generally the average um, saving across the UK is 12% of earnings is that the average individual across Europe saves 12% of earnings. That went up to 19% during the pandemic. But the most recent estimates put total UK savings at 250 billion compared to 500 billion across the rest of the Eurozone. And yeah. it, it, uh, the, the figures during the pandemic were saying, suggesting that 30 percent of the population, of the working population in the UK, was saving significant sums of money. And it was in the pre-pandemic period um, that the figures were sort of 15% in France, 10% in Germany, and 5% in the UK, and 4% in, in, uh, in Italy. But the UK went right to the top of the chart and kept going. And it's... It is an issue in the UK that one of the things is 
there are such huge savings and people are not uh, not inclined to spend. There's, you know, a real loss of confidence at the moment. And Adrian, finally, um, we've got touch with our, the, the political um, space in the UK at the moment. I mean, I've I've probably had longer trips to uh, to Europe than Liz Truss has spent as uh, Prime Minister. Um, but is there stability at the moment in the, in the UK political system? Is, have we got a Prime Minister that will be there for some time? I mean, when's your next national election? To The next election is January 25th. Um, yeah, that's the late. That's the latest date it can be. Um, I think and I hope that he will um, he will stay the course until that time. Um, I think the the risk factor is internal fighting. Um, yeah, because the, there's there's things have been too reactionary at the moment. You're seeing polls come out every day that says that the Tories are now 18% behind Labour and there's a new party coming up on the rails that, you know, in, in another four weeks could overtake the Tories. And But the reality is, unless the government collapses, there's not going to be another election for two years. And the the the, the initial signs on the fiscal policy that have been uh, that, have, that have come out are good. They've been well received. Um, and if the grandees in the Tory party can, can hold their nerve and just say, you know, it's 15% down today, well, so what? We've got two years to turn that round. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I think, I hope, because I think if, if we have another collapse and another in, and, and a, a general election early, I think it'd be catastrophic for us financially because this is such a huge loss of confidence in the market. Uh, fingers, fingers crossed that that doesn't occur. Adrian, thank you for your time. We, we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, and for the insight into uh, the UK and, and Europe um, generally, really, really appreciate it. Um, now, we're moving somewhere closer to me, um, which uh, us being based in... Melbourne, Australia, um, Southeast Asia is, is a, a big impactor on the Australian economy um, and uh, we have a, a specialist here today um, who I will introduce. Robert Law is, uh, is from Asia Link Business um, and is based here in Melbourne, as I've said. He's passionate about helping business unlock Asia um, growth opportunities. Uh, he's a former diplomat. Uh, intelligence analyst and strategy consultant. As a director, um, advisory and insights at um, Asia Link Business. He works with businesses that uh, in the Asian market and, uh, and assists in their entry and their growth strategies. Um, he's a trusted advisor to governments um, at, in a regional economic engagement. Um, and he often um, appears in the Australian Financial Review and the Australian newspapers to give it his insight into uh, Southeast Asia. Robert, good morning. Good morning for you. So thank you for uh, attending today. Uh, what are you finding in, in Southeast Asia and um, in Australia? Um, yeah, look, thanks, Brent. Um, really great to be here today. Um, joining you from Melbourne, um, and I do want to um, begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the lands of the Wiradjuri people. There, for those who are watching internationally, um, they are um, a, a, a clan or a people group of Indigenous Australians. Um, and I want to extend my respects to them uh, and their elders um, past and present. Um, and look, I've got a really tough job today because I'm, I'm going to try and give you some key takeaways on um, the economic outlook for Asia, which of course is a huge region with many really significant economies. Um, but I think there's really three um, key uh, headwinds that are, that are affecting the outlook in the region. Um, the first of those is the, the impact of the Ukraine war and um, what that's meaning for commodity prices. 
Um, the second is um, the outlook in um, developed economies um, around, um, uh, you know, slowing growth um, and, and tightening monetary policy. And, and, and we've heard a little bit about that from Art and Adrian. And, and the third, um, which might be a little surprising to some people watching in other parts of the world, is um, the, the ongoing impact of COVID. Um, and so I'm going to try and take you through just a, a couple of the um, more interesting economies in the region, um, China, then we'll go down into Southeast Asia and talk about Indonesia and Vietnam and, and finish up on, on India. I can't cover everything, um, but, but I think there's some interesting points we can talk about on those economies. Starting with China, um, and, and Art touched on this, um, the, the big question on, for markets is um, what is happening with um, China's zero COVID policy? When will China reopen? And, and just to contextualise this, you know, um, before this year, the forecast for growth in China was around 5.5%. Um, it's really hard to sort of put your finger on where China might land this year. I've, I've seen numbers anywhere from 2.8 to 3.3%. Um, but what's really clear is that um, China's zero COVID policy is really dampening economic growth. Um, it's dampening consumer demand, and it's had a significant um, disruption on supply chains. Um, now, the market is watching this really closely, and we saw just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, when the, when the Chinese announced um, some really small relaxation of rules around foreign visitors that uh, the market got quite excited, um, and there was a lot of optimism around China. But, but then just in the last few days, um, you have seen these protests in China um, you know, tens of millions of people are still locked down across major cities. Um, so it's incredibly difficult to know exactly how this will play out. Um, if, if I had to get out my crystal ball, which is a, a very dangerous thing to do, um, I would say that, you know, I don't think we're going to see any broad relaxation of the, the zero COVID policy until uh, at the very earliest after March next year. Um, and, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first is that um, it, the COVID policies that China has in place, uh, they're about politics. They're not about the economy and the economy is a secondary consideration right now. So they're really about um, politics and, and President Xi has, um, you know, aligned himself really closely with this policy. Um, and so to backtrack on it at this point would be, um, you know, qu quite a quite a change of direction. Um, it, it, indeed, the, the the Chinese government still likes to boast about how um, few deaths there have been in China compared to the US. It's a, it's a, a point of comparison they they draw all the time. Um, the second reason is why um, is because. Uh, you know, there's still some ongoing political processes that are happening in China. Um, and so, you know, many, many people watching today would have been familiar with the, the party congress that happened in October. That, that's actually the start of, of a, almost a six month um, process of, of political change, which culminates in the, in the National People's Congress in, in March. That's the, the equivalent of China's parliament. Um, so there's still a lot of change washing through the system that's come out of the Congress. And so it's hard to see any um, major policy changes um, happening before then. The, the third factor in all this is um, around development of um, an mRNA vaccine in China. Um, you know, a lot of the population has had um, vaccinations in China. About 90% of the population um, have had two shots. Um, it does start to tail off pretty quickly there when you, when you talk about boosters. Um, and crucially, um, those vaccinations are in, inactivated um, vaccines. They're not mRNA vaccines that, that many people in the West um, have access to. 
Um, so there's really just a lower level of protection um, across the Chinese population. And of course, you know, um, challenges in the health system if there were to be any um, large scale outbreak of COVID. Um, so we know that um, domestically produced mRNA vaccines are under um, development. Um, there's no timeline on when they might be rolled out. Um, what we do know is that actually in Indonesia, um, a trial of an mRNA vaccine has been approved. Will this be, you know, an important step um, forward in terms of China's own um, trials and, and so forth? Um, it, it's hard to say. Um, so, look, we'll see, we'll see adjustments, we'll see changes. Um, it will be messy. It will be uneven. Um, but a broad-based change of the policy is still quite some time away. Um, even so, um, you know, longer term, we're still we're still pretty um, bullish on China. Um, you know, the the challenges in the property sector are pretty well known. Um, we are seeing some small amounts of um, stimulus come through. The government's adjusting some, uh, you know, um, fiscal policies to try and um, sort of settle that sector down a bit. We saw a pretty um, you know, strong um, crackdown in the tech sector as well. Again, seeing some small indications that the government's walking um, back to sort of lessening um, some of those um, measures in the tech sector. So some encouraging signs there. Um, but but more, more generally, um, the fundamentals on China are so strong. Um, and, um, you know, by 2030, China is expected to have around 400 million upper middle class and, and middle class higher income households, 400 million. Um, that's consumers seeking access to you know, high quality products and services. Um, we've written about this recently in a report um, that we published called um, Risk and Reward, um, Opportunities for um, Small and Medium Businesses in China. Um, and look, at the end of the day, if, if businesses, you know, take a pretty sober view of the market, if they weigh the risks up against the reward, there is still a lot of opportunity there um, for businesses to take advantage of. Um, but I wouldn't want to get stuck in a discussion about um, Asia's economic outlook um, by only talking about China. So I, I think it's worth turning our attention to um, Southeast Asia. And the story is a little bit different in Southeast Asia. Um, the story is a bit more about um, how long can the, the post-COVID rebound continue? Um, and also what's the impact of um, rising inflation and rising commodity prices on the outlook of economies in the region? Um, so we have seen that commodities, fuel and oil prices um, have all dropped back to sort of pre-Ukraine invasion levels, um, <clears throat> which is quite good for the more developing economies of Southeast Asia. Um, it does lessen a little bit um, the pressures on, on consumers in those economies. Um, but equally, you know, they were also enjoying, um, you know, higher export revenues from their you know, sort of commodity based exports. So um, it's a double edged sword in terms of those commodity prices. Um, looking forward for the region, I think you'll really see a lot of focus on trying to um, uh, keep inflation under control and, and managing the impacts. Um, and, you know, you'll also see some um, challenges through exchange rate depreciation as, as monetary policy flows through in, in developing countries. Um, look, the standout economies in Southeast Asia have been for some time and will continue to be Indonesia and Vietnam. They're attracting a lot of international interest. Um, Indonesia's been really resilient this year. For people who aren't familiar with Indonesia, 270 million plus people. Um, growth is forecast at 5% at, at plus this year. Um, the, um, the rupiah has held up pretty well um, against the US dollar. Um, the country has good foreign exchange reserves. Um, and the Indonesian stock market was um, one of the world's best performers um, up until at least October. I think it's hit um, some, some speed bumps in the last month or so. But, you know, overall, the macroeconomic picture in, in Indonesia is um, pretty good. 
Uh, it, we will probably start to see some slowing going into next year as, as the global headwinds really come and hit the economy, but, but still quite, um, you know, uh, an economy to watch for the future. Uh, Robert, just, um, just a quick question. What's underpinning that growth in Indonesia? Is, is it commodities and what makes them u- unique and different to other countries in Southeast Asia? Oh, look, it is um, a very strongly um, uh, sort of domestically driven economy. It more the, the majority of growth does come from domestic consumption. So, um, you know, when living standards are rising and, and we are seeing the growth of the middle class in Indonesia, <clears throat> as those living standards do rise, um, the economy grows quite strongly as well. But, but there's also, I have to say, um, you know, increasing international attention in Indonesia. Um, you know, we're seeing um, uh, countries that, you know, you wouldn't think maybe had any sort of natural affinity or interest in Indonesia, like um, Canada and the Netherlands, um, you know, making major investments into the economy. And the government is, um, you know, bringing through a range of sort of reforms. I don't want to under play the challenges in Indonesia because they're certainly there around governance and, and other issues like that. Um, but it, it does um, offer a lot of promise in terms of um, the growing middle class um, consumption. And, and um, it, it'll also increasingly um, be a focal point for um, supply chains in, in the new economy. So um, expect to see Indonesia a big role in terms of sort of battery production and EVs going forward. We've seen, um, you know, Korean and Japanese car makers make major investments into the economy. So um, that will be one to watch in the future. Vietnam, uh, look, on track for about 7.5% growth. Um, Inflation is a bit of a challenge. Um, But look, Vietnam is currently the investment darling in Southeast Asia. It's attracting a lot of attention um, from businesses that want to diversify away from China. Um, you know, Apple, other, other manufacturers are looking at Vietnam. And the government has, um, you know, been putting in place um, domestic policy reforms. There's a real big um, push on um, digitisation that's washing through the economy. Um, so, um, you know, a lot to like about Vietnam from an international investment perspective and, and a growth perspective. I think it's worth um, just touching on India for a little bit. Um, Look, uh, again, you know, we've seen revisions to growth forecasts. Um, India was originally forecast to grow at about 7.5% this year. Um, It's probably going to land closer to 6.5% and that will be lower again next year. Uh, again, um, you know, the fundamentals around India are incredibly attractive. Um, the population is growing rapidly. So India's population will surpass China's next year. Um, and the middle class is, again, growing really quickly. Um, by 2030, you're looking at 475 million people in the middle class, you know, those people will be turbocharging demand for for goods and services. So um, the fundamentals in in India are really strong. The challenge in India is um, uh, we don't really have good visibility of um, the reform plans of of, um, the government. Modi um, doesn't really lay out, okay, these are the next things we're going to do in terms of um, economic policy or, or structural reform. Um, and so we, we do, it's a little hard to sort of predict um, what's going to play out in the market. Looking backwards, though, um, it has been quite a significant period of, of change um, in India. Um, for one thing, India historically has always shunned free trade agreements. They, they always, you know, um, put their time and effort and focus into the World Trade Organization and, and sort of multilateral trade systems. They've recently discovered and embraced FTAs. So they've concluded an FTA with Australia. Um, They're negotiating another one with the UK. Um, They've joined up to the US-led Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, So there's this real um, rediscovery of sort of um, what we call minilateral or bilateral free trade agreements. The other area that um, has really changed in the last few years 
And I think it went a little bit unnoticed because it was happening during COVID was India really um, shifted the dial on inbound foreign investment. Um, 165 billion FDI in 2021, 2022, um, you know, privatisation of significant amounts of um, government assets like toll roads and so on. Um, so, you know, uh, really the story for the last couple of years has been international investors flocking to India. Like um, a lot of other economies in the region, you know, there are still a lot of challenges um, and I don't want to downplay those either. India does rank really low in terms of ease of doing business and other indicators like that. Um, but overall, um, you know, another case where the, where the fundamentals um, are pretty attractive in, in the long term. So look, let me uh, pause there. I can't possibly cover the whole region, but hopefully you've given you um, a bit of a flavour of what we're seeing. Thank you, Robert. That that's that's fantastic. I really appreciate your um, our look and insight into Southeast Asia. Look, we're, we're just gone over the hour. Um, I'm conscious that people um, around the world will be either lunching or having dinner, um, and we want to keep it nice and tight. So I think it's probably a good time to uh, to wrap it up. Probably last minute um, insights into something that's, you know, I'll get back to the World Cup. Adrian, uh, has, has anyone got a view? I mean, can anyone else but England win it? I mean, that's that's what I want to know. I mean, it's it's a lockdown, isn't it, Adrian? It's, it's, it's fantastic. That you, <laughs> Saudi Arabia beat Argentina, so, you know, Anything's possible. Anything is possible. No, it, it is. It is. I think that's an exciting. Yeah, I, I'd like just one word. Now, I heard a, a seminar a couple of weeks ago, um, 10 days ago, and uh, if I can pronounce it, and I, and I wonder how much of an impact it's going to have on everything we've talked about tonight, and that is cryptocalypse. <laughs> um, Without Without a doubt. Yeah. What's uh, what's what's the talk about the cryptocurrency values in in the US? And there's more to come, is it? Is yeah, it certainly is. is. You know, when we talk about the extremes of risk and the extremes of investing, obviously cryptocurrency falls into that category. And we knew that there was going to come a point where higher interest rates and leverage was going to break something. And we finally found out what that was going to break, and it all transpired over. Uh, basically a 48 hour period. And now we're trying to figure out where all the tentacles reach here. So FTX went from being, you know, call it uh, Bear Stearns to actually being a Lehman to actually being, um, you know, something much worse than that, like an en Enron. And now it appears to be a Madoff, right? So it's gone. And that all happened in 24 hours. And yep. as that unfolds, the bad news is a lot of people that were connected to this um, exchange are, are, are going to have to file. But the good news is if there were nefarious and bad players, it, 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 this is the kind of process that's going to weed that out. So, you know, it, it feels as though there's more bad news in front of us before we get good news. But the bad news is coming at us very rapidly. So I think that whatever the end result is, is that it's going to happen, um, you know, likely, you know, but end of, end of this quarter and into the first quarter of next year before the dust settles. And, and that, that's my take on the on this uh, cryptopolis or whatever uh, Adrian called it. Yeah, yeah. You, you agree, Adrian? It's, um, you know, before we answer that, we, we, you know, one of the articles in today's paper, they were using various examples of the mums and dads who had invested 50% of their um, retirement savings, the superannuation, into cryptocurrency and, and how it froze and all, and the recoverability on that is very unlikely. It's, it just it amazes me that advisors put people in at this sort of level. Um, For me, it's just the interrelationship and the interconnectivity. Um, you know, today, the BlockFi exchange is far for Chapter 11 because they were heavily invested in in, uh, in FTX. And you had the same thing from, you know, the, the previous recent with Terra and Luna with holding huge reserves in Bitcoin. So they sell they sell the Bitcoin to, to prop up their pegged, uh, tokens supposed to be pegged to the dollar selling off all the bitcoin crashes the bitcoin price um and then and, you know one thing leads to another leads to the next so it's i, I think 
I think Art's right. I think it's there's going to be, hopefully it'll be quick. Um, but there's a lot more, there's a lot of people who've been sceptical all along who are saying, you know, it, it does look like a Ponzi scheme or, you know, close to it. Yeah, I'm waiting for the people who've been saying for some time, we told you so. We told you so. <laughs> Too good to be true. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, great, great insights around the world for the global economy. Uh, uh, in uh, North America, Adrian in uh, the UK and in Europe, thank you, and, and Robert in Southeast Asia and China. Really appreciate your time today. Um, and from all the BCG Global Advisory, thank you for your time. Um, have a fantastic end of uh, 2022, um, and we'll see you all next year. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. It's very enjoyable. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.